2012, a group of disabled asylum seekers came together as part of a research project, Disability Murals. They worked with artist Andrew Bolton to tell their stories through a public mural. Well, the picture that we are drawing, my bit is the one in the wheelchair, and the wheelchair is chained. The reason that it is chained is I feel restricted. I'm not free to do anything because I can't study, I can't work. The UK Border Agency is the one which is restricting asylum seekers. I feel like a criminal that I'm not allowed to do anything. The painting, I uh, like it because it's explaining about how things are going on with us in the country. Some of us are destitute. When you speak truth here, they say you are lying. When you lie, they say it's true. <laughs> We have no freedom. <laughs> and always we are having our luggage walking around. <laughs> you say you don't want to hear. They don't want to hear our stories. They don't want to accept our stories. That's why they put their hands in their ear. They don't want to hear. This is me. I lost my two brother. I'm going to show people who I am. I want to show people how is ins our inside because we have a pain. We need someone who stand by us to help us. While the British government recognises that disabled people face additional costs in their daily lives, the UK Border Agency does not provide disabled asylum seekers with any money to meet their additional needs. So I want to be in the house because I'm a destitute. Uh, if I can, if I always see fine houses, I want to be there. So that's my dream of having a house mm -hmm. with me and my daughter. Amy and her daughter Lucy have to live separately in different friends' houses. Lucy is deaf. Amy and Lucy have developed their own sign communication, but Lucy has no support to pay for British Sign Language classes or to meet other deaf people. Amy, Lucy and Camille all rely on friends and voluntary organisations while they fight for sanctuary in the UK. I am asking, have you seen anybody uh, to take this kind of medication and to live rough uh, without a, a good accommodation and healthy uh, food and empty stomach? So did the doctor told you to take those tablets with food? Yes, after food. But you don't have the food? No, I don't have a food, no. Well, so where am I? Am I in Afghanistan or Africa? Is this the human right and uh, the treatment I supposed to, to have and to get? People who ask for asylum in the UK are required to sign regularly at a police station or a reporting centre while the request is considered. This can go on for many years. Initially, I was required to sign weekly, and I requested UK Board Agency that in the wheelchair, it's very difficult for me. It's a three hours um, uh, journey, one and a half hour each way in the bus. I have to change two buses, and then it's 15, 20 minutes from the bus stop to the signing centre. When I wheel, it's very terrible feeling. My back is pressurised and I explained everything and they said, no, we can't do nothing. My case owner said that you've come miles away from your country to this country and you can't come uh, five miles just to sign in Dallas court. So I said I didn't have to wheel. So that's the kind of response I got. Manjeet was very fortunate to meet with RAPAR, a refugee organisation, who supported her to challenge the need for weekly signing so far from her home. It was a long process after a letter from my GP and my health consultant and my community care lawyer. He sent a letter to them that this is against disability discrimination. Uh, they need to uh, do adjust reasonable adjustments for a disabled person and for me it would be signing by phone or something like that. So they changed it to two weeks and then monthly and now they're installing a landline so that 
they can call me say once a week or once a month i don't know yet so it's quite a major achievement and yeah it took it took time but i'm happy manjeet has been supported by disabled people in her fight for accessible signing and for accessible accommodation but she hasn't been actively involved in disabled people's organizations they are fighting for their benefit cards they're fighting for their care needs monies etc while as i am an asylum seeker who's disabled but i have to fight for my case for right to stay here i don't get any benefits i don't get any care needs our lives are co- totally different even though i'm disabled but because i'm an asylum seeker it changes everything the uk border agency told us that when a person claims asylum in the uk they should receive asylum information and a health assessment within 48 hours did the immigration services ever provide you with a health assessment no did anyone from the immigration services ever tell you about the possibility of a community care assessment no did they ever tell you about your right to have accessible accommodation no so that when you got your flat changed to make it more accessible that was just from your own individual campaign. effort yeah. yeah our experience is that you have to either self or on behalf of another advocate um very um forcefully in order to draw down any resource whatsoever that relates to any aspect of your need and and irrespective of whether you're somebody who would be immediately recognized as being disabled or not so um our experience is that community care mechanisms become engaged in reaction to strident advocacy um and without that they simply aren't visible um they're certainly not sitting there waiting to be activated there's certainly no automatic activation that i'm aware of or that i've ever seen mary like many many other asylum seekers finds the stress of living in constant fear of detention and deportation almost unbearable i have a lot of experience like nightmare panic attack flashback i'm not sleeping well there's a lot of uh, mental health problems and memory was low i forget it very quickly the picture i draw is how i want to jump down from this 12th floor when i saw the immigration bus that is taking people for deportation so i want to jump down from 12th floor william fled his home country traumatized by events there here he has spent 3 years in detention with inappropriate and inadequate support for his post traumatic stress and mental health so they were providing me the, the, um, the proper medical care and I had no counseling and for each time I put forward these these contentions they were taking from one detention to the other from Dongebo to Okington from Okington to Collingbrook from Collingbrook to Hammersworth as a matter of fact all the time I stayed in detention right I never had the proper health care In 2008 I mean 11 I should have died but hang myself but god knows why because it was an officer who came and, and stopped me and, 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 and stopped the process we are in detention that is the most psychological mental torture ever because you are afraid of persecution and all the hope you have turn against you so tell me what are you when you are detained you are nobody if you can't go back home and you can't come back in So what are you? You nothing. The press don't even care. With the support of Detention Action and others, William now has leave to remain in the UK for 3 years and is receiving some medical support. Well, I tell you what, they have taken something from me that they cannot replace. A part of me is missing. Even up to now, I still have dreams and flashbacks. I still have panic attacks. But if I had the support, if I had the proper assessment done earlier, Eh? I wouldn't have descended into yeah. the, the psychotic difficulties I I I, I, I had before that I'm facing now. 
So what are you doing here today? We're here to make sure that Mary Adenukwa um, remains in Manchester and is safe. Mary's claim for asylum has been rejected and with support from Rappa, she is preparing an appeal against this decision. Having accepted that Mary's been trafficked and Britain signed up to the protocol on trafficking, they've just completely thrown that out the window. Mary's very frightened about going back to Nigeria because the instance of trafficked women being picked up again by the traffickers is very high. The facilities for trafficked women are minuscule and in fact the resources for mental health treatment are very small and you have to pay for it all. And she's got nothing in Nigeria at all. It's such a convoluted process. It's a violating process. It's quite a chaotic process. The other thing about all this is it's designed to be permanently disruptive. You've got no leverage whatsoever around negotiating with the UKBA about the way in which you live your life. The state is using the population seeking asylum as a little bit of a laboratory. So they'll do things to that population which is relatively powerless. And if they can get away with doing it to that population, it will seep out into the wider population. Now, the latest example of that is the bedroom tax. The forcible dispersal of British citizens that's being enacted through the bedroom tax was actually instituted against people seeking asylum in 2002. And as much as people have objected to it, they failed to stop it happening. So here we are, 10 years later, a tried and tested process. They know how to do it. And now they're applying it to a wider section of the population. With people living with disabilities who are in the asylum system, it's even more profound, isn't it? Because whatever relative powerlessness there is, it's more concentrated if you're also confronting disability and a need that you have because you are disabled. So if they get away with ignoring or denying or negating the rights of the person with the disability who is in the asylum system, they start to get away with that inside of the wider population as well. I think the same seepage can occur. There's a need for people to be honest about what is actually happening to people seeking asylum because what is happening to people to seeking asylum is terrible. And there's quite a large conspiracy of silence around it. Detention in this country is a direct opposite of human rights. I think ordinary people, through a petition and a resolution, should call for an inquiry into all the deaths in detention. Because when these inquiries you know, are being answered, then people will see the true picture of detention. The biggest barrier that I've faced is my needs not being met. I feel that I was ignored completely. My disability was ignored. I always take it as another battle. Since I've come from Afghanistan, fleeing persecution from India, I think coming here is another battle that I'm I'm having to fight. It's not ended. It, coming here has not ended anything. It's it's a different thing. Just that there, you know that they're there to kill you. Here, it's in a different way. You, you're trying hard to stay here, but you know that y you can be deported any time. So it's a battle. This mural, created by disabled asylum seekers, is in Bristol city centre. For more information on the issues raised in this film or the work of Disability Murals, please contact Rebecca at disabilitymurals.org.uk.